welcoming Erin Rennie. Yay. Uh, hi, Erin. And we're going to be learning about two projects that support the consideration of social equity and social connectedness in the ways we plan and design homes, communities, and the region as a whole. So in just a second here, we're going to pass it off to Erin Rennie. I wish I had a big thing that was like, <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I really appreciate the, the reminder to stretch. I always forget to stretch during the day. So I try to take people up on it when they suggest it. Um, should I get started with my slides? Yeah, you can do that for sure. Okey OK, well. Um, yeah, uh, really nice to see you all this morning. I'm, I'm delighted that you're here uh, to, to tackle social isolation, such an important topic. And uh, I, my name is Erin. I'm a senior planner. I work at Metro Vancouver uh, in the regional planning department. And the topic of my presentation is planning for social connections. So I do a lot of research on how to build great communities across the region. I share that with municipal planners and uh, a lot of my research recently has been on the topic of social equity and, and also been working with organizations who are exploring the topic of social connection. So I'm going to share some of that research. I hope you find it interesting and inspiring and, uh, and helps you support your, your solution. So I've got three parts to my presentation. The first is, what is the link between social connection and city planning? The second is about the link between social connection and social equity. And then I'll leave you with just a few reflection questions to get you thinking about how you could apply an equity lens to your solution. So what is the link between social connection and, um, and city planning? We under, understand social connectedness to mean the multiple ways that individuals connect. And uh, we, we relate it to the other con uh, uh, closely, asso closely associated concepts of social cohesion, social capital, and social trust. So if you have a chance, I encourage you to Google those, those terms because there's lots of great research um, connected with them. The opposite is loneliness and that feeling of social isolation. And why are we interested in this topic as city planners? Well, it's because social connectedness is associated with so many of the other things that we're working towards as city planners. It's associated with better health outcomes. It's associated with greater resilience in a crisis. And it's associated with higher levels of civic engagement. So thinking about things like the heat dome, for example, that's an example of how uh, folks with, with good social connectedness who had people checking in on them on a regular basis were more likely to come through the heat dome um, with better health outcomes. And, and the, the opposite we see across uh, in, in all sorts of examples of uh, instances of, of a crisis where the folks who are the most isolated are, are some of the most vulnerable. Civic engagement, similarly, um, more connected uh, or, or so highly associated with, with social connectedness. So if you're connected in your community, you know folks, you're talking about other things, other ways that you can be involved, volunteering in your community, voting, um, running for office, et cetera. But there are some important barriers to social connectedness, and those include things like income insecurity. So consider if, if an individual is working three part-time jobs and they're taking transit across the region, they don't have a lot of space in their day for forming strong relationships and, and connecting in their communities. Security of tenure is another important barrier. So think about, uh, uh, that's sort of the difference between renting and owning and, and whether you have a, a sense of security that you can stay in your home over the long term. Many renters have to move out of uh, uh, reasons that are not in their control and, and not of their choice. Things like their rent is going up or their building is being replaced. And so if you're moving a lot, it's difficult to form and maintain your social connections. Some other important barriers, bad housing design, a lack of neighborhood amenities like plazas and parks and gazebos, places where people connect. And then of course, systemic discrimination uh, is, is highly associated with, with isolation and loneliness. 
So as uh, regional planners, we're thinking about the long term over the next 30 years. We know many, many people are going to be moving to this region and being born in this region and more and more people are going to be living in higher density communities. So we ask ourselves, what can we do to make sure that these growing communities are good places for social connection? And what the research is telling us is that there are many examples of things that work really well. So we know that we have to embrace the principle of social equity in everything we do. We need to find ways to enable residents to stay in their communities, even if they have to move out of their home. If they can stay in their neighborhood, they maintain their, their connections. We can do a better job of encouraging architecture and urban design that uh, enables the creation of spaces that support more and better connections. There are um, a great examples of programming that can be done to support connection. And then prioritizing underserved neighborhoods for social infrastructure like libraries, gazebos, plazas, parks is another great example. I'm gonna provide a few more examples of what is working well. Hey Neighbor is a research collective that piloted, um, their, they did their first few pilots here in Vancouver and they've since expanded across the province. And they are doing research on how to help people who are renters living in multifamily buildings feel more connected to their neighbors. And here are some examples of what has been working. Things like activities and events, encouraging volunteers who live in the building to help host those events and activities, creating projects for residents to work on together and having buildings where everyone is welcome. So pets are welcome, children are welcome, people with disabilities are welcome. These are some factors that support that connection. Here's another great example from City of Victoria. This is a project called Connect and Prepare and this brings people together who live in the same building or the same uh, neighborhood, and it uh, gets them working together on an emergency preparedness plan. And so not only are they preparing for an emergency in a practical way, they're also working together on a project which helps them meet each other and form those relationships that they can rely on in the instance of a crisis. Um, creating gathering spaces where people can meet and connect and feel uh, like they are part of the city is really important. So here's some great examples you might be familiar with. The steps at the Vancouver Art Gallery, this playground at uh, Olympic Village, Jonathan Rogers Park is always full of people. What makes these places great, uh, great places to stop, spend some time and meet up with somebody or meet somebody new? You can probably think of a few examples in your day-to-day -day life. Start to notice what kinds of architectural uh, uh, design factors help support that sense of community connection. And then there are um, other ways to support connection in placemaking. This is called um, uh, activating spaces. It's also often called tactical urbanism. And it's basically the practice of using low cost and temporary materials to uh, reinvigorate an existing space to make it feel more safe and more welcoming. So you might have seen uh, the Keys to the Streets project a few years ago, putting pianos in, uh, in different public spaces across the city to encourage neighbors and people to connect over music. This uh, example in the center is from the city of North Vancouver and they had some students come in and do an art project in this alley put in a few planter boxes and now they've created a safe and welcoming space where people want to stop and have a coffee break. And then uh, another great example is the, the rainbow crosswalks. What a great way to both beautify an urban area while also signaling to people that they are welcome and that all forms of diversity are, are um, can belong in, in, a, in an urban area. So those are some examples of what's working. I wanna move on to, to uh, a, a second project that I've been working on lately around uh, social equity. And we know that social equity and social isolation have some important connections and, and many social equity factors are associated with, with um, high levels of, of loneliness and isolation. Here's a, a few uh, just tidbits taken out of the My Health, My Community survey results. This was a 2014 survey that Vancouver Coastal Health did of 
thousands and thousands of Lower Mainland residents. And I'm going to provide a link to um, a, a summary sheet in, in the end of my presentation. I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, they found some really interesting things. One of the things they found is that social isolation is more common among men, among people who are 40 to 64 years old, and people who live in urban areas. And they also found that among those people with really high levels of social isolation, those folks were more likely to have an education level, of high school level or, or lower, to have an income below $40,000 a year, to be unemployed, to feel stressed, and in the case of the Fraser Health Area, to identify as LGBTQ, and in the Vancouver Coastal Health Area, to be um, a person who was not born in Canada. So do have a look at the, that fact sheet that I'm going to link at the end of my presentation. Uh, we wanted to know here at Metro Vancouver what social equity is looking like on the ground uh, here in this region. So we did a project last year to map 49 different social equity indicators um, and, and make those maps available. So what I'm going to be doing right now is actually I'm going to post it in the chat. Uh, a link to all of these maps so you can start um, pulling them up uh, in, in greater detail because I know my, my images here are not really good quality, but I'm going to flip through a few that I think you might be interested in. So these maps, we have maps on demograph demographic factors like percentage of seniors, the percentage of uh, people who are single parents, and then we also have conditions that we have mapped, housing conditions, poverty conditions, environmental conditions, etc. Uh, let me just go to the next slide. There are there is a lot of data, so try not to get too overwhelmed. I'm, I've pulled out a few of the maps that I think might be interesting for this project specifically. But before I go into that, I do want to acknowledge a few limitations to this research. First of all, this was a top-down exercise. It was done by government professionals. We were not able to do um, as much um, engagement with the communities that we want to serve as we were doing this. So, so we want to acknowledge this is just a first cut. We need to do closer grained uh, research to really understand these problems. And anybody who is going to use these maps should, should bear that in mind because, uh, because whenever you're doing um, uh, some kind of uh, project to, to try to support people on the ground. You want to be working with them and uh, ensuring that, um, that that you have a good understanding of what the problem actually is, if there a problem exists, and make sure that they are full partners in developing a solution. Also, uh, we have some significant data gaps. Not all forms of social equity can be mapped. So think about things like uh, accessibility issues, like uh, uh, mobility, disability. Very difficult to map that at the regional scale. So those are some forms of equities that, that are not going to um, show up on, on these maps. So just to give you a, a quick uh, a guide on how to read these maps, Basically, the, the topic that we've mapped is in, in the top here. So this one is uh, percentage of people in a neighborhood who have more than four people who they can confide in. And the darker the purple, the higher the level of whatever uh, social equity factor we're measuring. In the top right corner, we've, we've explained it and, and explained the data source. So in this map, what you're looking at, the darker the purple, that is neighborhoods where people have, um, uh, there are fewer people with good levels of uh, uh, a sense of uh, having a, enough people to confide in. Here's another map showing a strong sense of community belonging, unemployment rates, housing tenure, no post-secondary education, uh, visible minorities, average commute time, voter turnout, it goes on and on, long-term residency, poverty, access to parks, and sense of safety, though, just to name a few. But I do encourage you to take a look at that, uh, that link that I've posted and um, start flipping through those maps to see if any of that data could help inform your, um, your solution design. So what I want to do now is uh, just leave you with a few reflection questions to get you thinking about how you can start to apply an equity lens to your solution. So uh, first, can you use any of these equity maps to help prioritize supports or investments for more equitable outcomes? 
ask yourself, is this solution going to benefit men and women and non-binary people? And will this solution uh, perpetuate negative stereotypes? Will your solution benefit people of all ages and abilities? Or will you target a particular age group deliberately? Are these are there barriers to participation that you could anticipate and address in your solution design? So things like transportation barriers, technology access, cost, language barriers. Uh, can, you, can your solution help to support reconciliation in any way? Are you being culturally sensitive? Are there opportunities to, host, uh, to partner with host First Nations? And finally, uh, can your solution, it, will your solution potentially have any unintended negative consequences? So watch out for things like perpetuating negative stereotypes or stigma, tokenism, speaking on behalf of a group that you don't belong to, and, uh, and privacy and confidentiality concerns. Finally, get curious. What, what privileges and biases do you come to the table with? What could help widen your perspective? It's really hard to do. So as promised, I've included a few links here. Uh, the top one is that, that fact sheet from the My Health, My Community survey. Um, the second one is more information on that Hey Neighbor Collective research, really, really rich information there. And then the last link is the, the equity baseline maps. And that's all I have for you this morning. So uh, we've got some time for Q&A. Uh, uh, I'm really eager to hear what questions or reflections you have uh, so far. So thanks again. Thanks, Erin. Um, could you quickly just pop those three links in the chat? Someone, um, Libby's just asking to have those in there. And then we have a question from Alexa. And that is, can you please list the particular maps along or among the 57 that you found that would be helpful for the hackathon problem statement? Um, she didn't get a chance to note those down. So if we could do both of those, that would be super helpful. Yeah, I can do that. And I, I believe these slides are being provided to everybody, right? They should be, yeah. Yeah, somewhere. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Or do you want me to flip to a slide that, that I went through too quickly? No, I have a question. Um, uh, Rodrigo from HMA. Um, so, uh, when uh, we take care of uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, important problems, yeah. like, um, it can be taken as negative impacts. The fact that you have to go, sorry, I'm gonna turn on my camera. Uh, the fact that you can um, uh, uh, emerge things that they might be like troubling politically uh, wise. So you want to look into things that they are important to look at, but that might trigger some, uh, you know, effervescent, uh, I don't know how to put it in, in English, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, that some people might cause it, might that they're negative. So to look at the truth, sometimes is the, a negative thing because it will. So when you were mentioning about things that if your project would succeed, if that sometimes the negative things are positive for the proposal, you know? So these uh, problems that nobody wants to see make it, make it trigger like a, some kind of a imbalance. I'm, I'm seriously talking about. I think politics is the uh, is the the one that triggers the most, uh, or is, is is very relevant in this case. It's like a not seeing, but things are happening in your face. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm just wondering about uh, that uh, um, uh, negativism. It could be looked at as something positive. You know what I mean? Yeah, thanks, Rodrigo. I think I understand what you're getting at. Uh, yeah, these are these are sensitive topics, and um, sometimes people have feelings about them that they're not even really conscious of, and they just sort of 
come up. And uh, I've certainly experienced that as I'm going around and talking about this research. And sometimes I have really strong feelings about, about this research. It's, it's really close to my heart. And so um, definitely you have to be thinking about your own biases, your own passions and experiences and um, and and be be conscious of that. Be conscious of the fact that other people have different opinions, especially about some of these political considerations. I think what has worked really well for me uh, as a planner is to to focus on um, uh, focus on the science and the research. So so things that people can't really argue with. A lot of this information comes right out of the census or, or surveys, and you can't really argue with that. Um, and then the, the other thing that I have found to be successful is uh, to focus on the co-benefits or the ways in which we all benefit when we, um, when we take a, a step in, in a direction. So we often call this the curb cut effect if you think about like a sidewalk, you know, where there's a curb cut going down to the street and it makes it easier to pull your, your, your trolley or your, your child's um, a stroller, Th those were originally designed just for people with wheelchairs, right? But it actually benefits everybody. Everybody can get on and off the sidewalk better. And so think about how sometimes we can design a solution that is specifically there to alle alleviate an inequity in society but could also have co-benefits and make it better for everybody in the world. I hope that that speaks to your, your question. Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Erin. Everyone, round of applause, way to go. Such an important topic. Um, we have reached our time and we're gonna be wel welcoming in Ash McLeod very soon. Um, we so appreciate everything, all the information that you gave us. Um, and there's a couple more questions in the chat that we'll be able to answer in a little bit here, um, just separately. Um, and we've got, uh, yeah, like about five, well, seven minutes until we've got Ash coming on. So um, there were a couple more. I think Tyler asked um, one and then Jer asked one, if you wanna take a look at those. Um, Tyler said, you asked if our solution includes or excludes certain demographics. Do you have any examples of something that you that would exclude people? If that makes sense. Maybe Tyler, if you want to chime in. Oh, I just, I, uh, it didn't have to be like a, a real example in Vancouver, but just to get our brains kind of rolling, like what, what would exclude somebody versus include somebody? Hmm. Sure. Uh, well, what about, uh, what about offering, um, if, if you want to have an event, offering childcare so that parents with young children have an opportunity to participate in the event um, and they, they have somebody who, who can look after their children or um, making sure that there's a sign language interpreter or a, a service to translate your materials into another language so that you're not excluding somebody who, 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 who has a hearing impairment or doesn't speak English. Um, those, those are some, some examples that come to mind for me. Uh, I saw Jer had a question. Yeah, hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for the presentation. Really enjoyed uh, your perspective on all of it. My question was in uh, regards to some of the earlier material you shared. Um, just wondering, out of the engagement that, engagements that you highlighted in a public um, spectrum, what you personally found to be most effective, like in terms of bridging cultural divides or age gaps uh, in public spaces, I, I think just while you're here, I'd love to have your insight on that. Sure. Um, I, I think food, food is a wonderful way to bring people together. Everybody needs to eat. Uh, 
you know, think about your family and how you could have lots of different opinions and ages, but everybody wants to come together for, for a meal. So that's, that's a great way to get engagement started. Um, I, I'm going to link a great resource on more equitable engagement in, in the chat that, uh, that I encourage you to take a look at. Thank you so much. Okay, Laura, do you want, do you want me to answer any more or are you ready to move on? Um, I think that we've got everyone's questions. Um, there was one from Eleanor. Any recommendations for making digital solutions more accessible to all audiences? And I think that'll be our last question, but you can go ahead and answer. Sure. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind for me is the idea of plain language. There's some really great plain language guides out there that can help you um, take any written content you might have on your website or in your materials and make it just really easy for a person to understand what it's about and, um, and what you're trying to get them to do. So, so that's just all about changing your more technical language into something more simple, shortening your sentences. That's a really good solution. I'm sure many of the people around the table here have some, some great uh, sort of insights into technical solutions for making technology more accessible for different, um, different, different learning styles and languages and, and so on. Awesome, do you have the link or a website that we could take a look at that would highlight the plain language you just described? Yep, yep, I will post that in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Awesome, well, we have three more minutes-ish and then um, Ash will be on, but thank you so much, Erin, that was amazing. And everyone will give their thanks in the chat. Silent thank yous. <laughs> thank you. Have a really good time. I'm so glad you're tackling this important issue. I, I think that's uh, that's so great. So um, do feel free to reach.